Today we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel 17, and, and um, it's a very famous, very famous passage that relates to David and uh, a giant by the name of Goliath. And you're going to be seeing in just a moment that Goliath is indeed a giant, according to verse 4 here in chapter 17. He was six cubits and a span. Well, a cubit is 18 inches. And so what you have here is a man who is nine foot nine. That's how tall he is. Now, I've used, you know, this, I've spoken of David and Goliath in a variety of ways. And many of you have, have uh, heard the story of David and Goliath, and you know that Goliath was a giant, but you don't really have any way of knowing the height difference. Well, David was probably somewhere around my height. Goliath was nine foot nine. And so we actually have a prop I want you to see. And I have two Philistines who came to church today who said that they would help me with this. And hopefully they'll come out, my Philistine friends, come and help me now. There you are. <laughs> my Philistine friends, David and Lionel. There you go. Nine foot nine. And seeing that David was about my height, this is what you're looking at. <laughs> nine foot nine. And in proportion, this would have been kind of what David was dealing with when he saw this man come out with his shield and his sword and his spear and his javelin. This is the height of the man that was going to go into battle with David. You can understand why the people of Israel were greatly afraid. And I wanted you to see this difference. This is me at all five foot eight of me and, uh, and my buddy Goliath. Okay, thank you guys. I like him at my feet just like that. <laughs> thank you. First Samuel chapter 17, David and Goliath. Verse 1, reading to verse 3. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soho, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soho and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they were encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Now what we're going to do is, we've got 58 verses in chapter 17. I'm going to be reading all of this as is the normal way that I teach. And there'll be times that I'll, I'll just read passages and make some comments. But I'm really moving into some application that we're going to find at our conclusion here. But what we're looking at is David fighting a giant by the name of Goliath. And we have the the geographic location is really in the southern. It's in Judah, which is southern Israel. It's just outside of Bethlehem, about 15 miles or so outside of Bethlehem, that all of this is taking place. And so what you have is you have, uh, you have a giant by the name of Goliath who is taunting the army, the army of, uh, of the uh, nation of Israel. Now we know that uh, in chapter 16 we were introduced to David, and you saw a description of him in verse 18. In chapter 16, verse 18, it was, he was described in this way. He is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. We were introduced to him because Saul, the king of Israel, had a distressing spirit that had been sent by the Lord because the spirit of the Lord had departed from him, and he was terrified, and they were looking for somebody who could minister through music to this man by the name of Saul. David was the one who was going to be chosen to do that, and ultimately David became the one who not only sang to him, but became an armor bearer to the king of Israel, the very first king by the name of Saul. Now, at the same time, God had chosen to reject Saul from being king. And so what God did is God had a man that he had chosen, a man by the name of David. And uh, so he had sent Samuel to Bethlehem in order that Samuel might anoint David as king. We know that, um, that David's father, Jesse, had eight sons all together at this time, and he caused his seven sons, the older ones, to pass before uh, Samuel, but not one of those men met the criteria. The Holy Spirit kept telling him, this is not the one. Ultimately, he asked the question, is there another son? They said, yes, there's one. He's keeping the sheep. Well, bring him out. I won't sit down until he's here. 
We know the story. We know what happened. He came and, and the Lord's anointed was standing before him. Samuel anoints him and uh, basically end of story. Now, David's father Jesse, as well as his brothers, more than likely misunderstood what was taking place at that time and felt that the anointing may have been an indication that, that uh, Samuel was going to spend some time with him, discipling him in ministry. They did not associate him at this moment with being the king. And so that's what we've been seeing up to this point. And so when we enter into chapter 17, what we see here is we see that now the Philistines are continuing to plague Israel. Once again, they're battling uh, against them. They're, they line up in order that they might uh, engage in combat. And uh, they're in this place that's called the Valley of Elah. And as this is taking place, verse 4 says, A champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So he was nine foot nine inches tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's 125 pounds. He had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, which is 15 pounds, and a shield bearer went before him. So the spear that he had had a 15-pound spearhead, but the entire uh, spear weighed something like 37 pounds. What you see is a magnificent fighting machine. In his, his outfit tells us that he's wearing the, uh, the, uh, the very latest technological advancement when it comes to, to warfare. He's wearing bronze. He has a, a spear with a, an iron tip on it. And uh, he's a huge individual, nine feet nine. Now, when you look at nine feet nine, I was interested. I was thinking, now, if he was nine feet nine, in proportion, how much must he weigh? Because if somebody weighs nine foot nine, how much proportion would, would he weigh? He would have weighed, according to some, between six and seven hundred pounds. So you have a six to seven hundred pound man who's nine feet nine, coming out daily, and you'll see this in just a moment, taunting the, na the nation of Israel, the armies of Israel, challenging them to man-to-man -man combat. Now, there are those who would say, that's one of the reasons why I have a problem with the Bible. Nobody could grow to be nine foot nine, so there's some scribal error of some sort. There's something here that really is not accurate. You really can't believe the Bible is accurate. But they're forgetting recent history. The tallest man on record that we know of is a man by the name of Robert Wadlow. Robert Wadlow was called the Gentle Giant, and he was 8 feet 11 inches tall. And so there are human beings, even to this day, that grow to the height of over 8 feet. And Goliath was a human being whom at this time was huge, of course. He was a 9 foot 9 inch man. Now, the Bible speaks concerning giants all the way back in the book of Genesis and treats them as actual entities, like they really existed. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, it says, There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And so from the beginning, you had giants. Uh, in, in Deuteronomy, in chapter 3, verse 13, the fifth book of the Old Testament, it says, All the region of Argob with all Bashan was called the land of the giants. And so giants existed during the time of the writing of the Old Testament. A giant existed during the time of, uh, of Samuel. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing a giant by the name of Goliath. The name Goliath means splendor. And when you begin to look at his name, Splendor, plus where he came from, and I want you to notice it, how it's stated here that he was, he was a, a giant, a Goliath from Gath. It gives you some insight because Goliath means Splendor. Gath is one of the five principal cities of the Philistines, so it tells us that he represents the best of the Philistines. He is the Splendor of the flesh, and that's the picture that you have with Goliath as he comes out. And what he does is he begins to taunt and challenge the armies of Israel. Notice verse 8. It's, it says there, He stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, 
then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words in the Philistine, of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who, were, who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the, the third Shema. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and, and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. So 40 days he would come and taunt them. 40 days he came and challenged them. Am I not a Philistine? You the servants of Saul. Choose a man for yourselves. Let him come down and fight. If I beat him, you'll be my servant, our servants. If, if he beats me, we'll be your servants every day for 40 solid days. Now remember, 40 in Scripture is the number of testing. And so Israel is under a test right now. And here comes this giant, this huge man, 9 foot 9, 700 pound man in full battle armor, every day challenging, every day taunting, every day defying the armies of the living God. Well, in verse 17, Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain, these ten loaves, run to your brothers at the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. So he sends them on an errand. He says, I want you to take this grain, I want you to bring these, this bread, I want you to bring this cheese, I want you to give it so you can supply them with some food, but I also want you to come back and give me information concerning their well-being and what's happening. Now Saul and and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. David left his supplies in the hand of a supply keeper, ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then, as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. You've come down to see the battle. David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him to, toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. David is there making his delivery. He goes to see where his brothers are, how they're doing. That's what dad told him to do. But as he's there, here comes this nine foot nine man. Here comes Splendor. And he begins once again to go into what he's been saying for 40 days. The response of the people who hear is nothing but fear. Even the king himself is afraid what's taking place here. And as David is listening, you see something about David's heart. Notice verse 26. What shall be done for the, for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You see something in the heart of David. You see something coming out even as he sees this, this one come and challenge the, the armies of Israel. 
You see how he feels about this. One, he, he recognizes that Goliath's challenge is, is not just to individuals. He's not asking to, to fight a Jewish champion. What he's actually doing is mocking the entire nation of Israel when he comes doing that. Because what he's bringing is shame to the entire nation. That's what he's speaking of about reproach of Israel. But the second thing I want you to see is that he shows the heart of a warrior. And he has a righteous indignation when he speaks of Goliath. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now when he says that, when he says who is this uncircumcised person, we need to remember that circumcision in Israel was a symbol of a man's covenantal relationship with God. And, and a man who was circumcised was under a picture of a covenant. He had a relationship with the God who delivers. And when he says this one is uncircumcised, what he's saying is he doesn't have a connection to God. This man is uncircumcised. He cannot look to God for help. And a second thing, he's speaking concerning the living God. This one's defying the armies of the living God. And the second thing he's saying here is this pagan worships idols. Idols don't have any life. They cannot give help in people's time of need. So what we're dealing with right now, and it's very religious what he's speaking here, is a man who's speaking very faith-filled words. He's saying what you have here is an enemy that can be defeated because his help will not come from God. This is an individual who is uncircumcised, who worships dead idols. He can have that tree, and he can carve it into that idol, and he can bow before it, but it has eyes and cannot see, it has a nose and cannot smell, it has ears and cannot hear, it has a mouth and cannot speak, hands it has and cannot deliver, feet it has and cannot walk. He said, these things are basically without life and senseless, and why would you be afraid of them? And that's what David is saying here. He's making it very clear that Goliath has no way that he can beat him. No way that this one can defeat us. We are the armies of the living God. Now as this is taking place, Eliab, his older brother, being an older brother, sees him and says, I know what's on your mind. I know what's in your insolent little naughty heart. You came here to provoke people using this exhortation and all to get somebody to go and fight so you can watch a battle. That's what you're here to do. David's response, what have I done? Is there not a cause? In other words, Eliab, haven't you seen and haven't you heard? And hasn't it provoked your heart? Why are you not upset at what this one is saying here? And that's how it's going and that's what's happening. Now as this takes place, verse 31, uh, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. <laughs> You're a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it, delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard. That word beard literally is its chin. I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So he goes and he speaks to Saul, because Saul has heard that David is saying what David is saying. And as Saul is looking at him and he sees this young man, he's saying, listen, you know, I, basically he's saying, I appreciate your heart, I appreciate the zeal that you have, but you need to understand you're young and he's been a warrior since he was young. This is a man who is battle-hardened and battle-tried, and David, to be honest with you, you don't have a chance. There's no way that you can defeat this one. There's no way that you can take Goliath out. Well, David says, now let me tell you something. I I'm a shepherd. I take care of sheep. If a lion or a bear comes and tries to take a lamb out of the, uh, out of the flock, 
I have risen up against him. I have taken him by the chin. I have taken my staff and I have killed him. This uncircumcised Philistine is not going to give me any more problems than a bear or a lion does. Now I have to be honest with you. A bear or a lion, that's enough problems for me. Let alone a nine foot nine inch man who's battle hardened and tested. But that's what he's saying. So as he's saying that to him, Saul knows that he's not going to be able to prevail in his opinion. So he says, well, well, let me at least give you some armor. So he gives him basically a, a bronze helmet. He gives to him some mail. He, he actually equips him in such a way that, that if David's there on the battlefield and people look, they might even think for a moment at a distance that that's the king going out to war because he's wearing some of the garments that, that Saul himself would be wearing. So in, in a way, it would be Saul actually setting it up that he might get a little glory from this. But besides that, as he hands him these things and says, you go on out and you do this battle, I want to give you my armor and all. David, when he puts on the mail and he tries to strap on that sword, doesn't feel comfortable. It's heavy and it's awkward and it, it doesn't suit his style. And so he says, no, I haven't tested these. I want to go with what works for me. So he goes to the brook and he takes from the brook these five smooth stones, puts them in his shepherd's pouch, he has his sling with him. And off he goes to confront the giant. Now, as this is taking place, verse 41, the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. He was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me. And I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. Well, David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you, and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharaim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I don't know. So the king said, Inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. Saul is going to give him his daughter, and he wants to make sure his lineage is fine. I want to get very practical with you as I look at this because as we see this, there are some very practical things that we can learn from this story. I want you to notice something here, something as we begin. This is where I want to make application. I want you to see something. I want you to look at verse 47 with me because this is going to be a key for us to understand. David's victory is going to demonstrate to all that there is a God in Israel. David knew that the Philistines were at war with God when they challenged Israel and he knew that the battle was the Lord's. He knew that the battle was the Lord's. He said, all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not say with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And that's why he could run towards him, and that's why he would engage him, because he knew that the battle belongs to God. He knew that God was the one who was going to take care of this. Now, 
Proverbs 21, 31 says, A horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. This is something that David understood. David knew that. David knew that God was on his side. David knew that Goliath was representing evil. He was representing those who had no relationship with God. He was an uncircumcised pagan. And David represented God, God who had a covenant relationship with the nation of Israel. And David was not afraid because he trusted in the Lord. Now David had on him five smooth stones. There are those who would say that this really demonstrated a lack of faith on the part of David. Because they say, and I've read commentators who have said, well, David had five smooth stones. In the event that he missed with the first, he might hit him with the second, and he had up to five opportunities. That's not what took place. That's not why he had five smooth stones. We know why he has five smooth stones, because 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 22 lets us know. In 2 Samuel 21, 22, it says, These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Gath, the giant of Gath, Goliath, had four sons. And what David was doing when he picked up five stones is he's saying this, I'm going to take out Goliath and his four boys too. I'm going to take the whole family out. I'm not just taking out one, I'm taking them all out. This shows the heart of a warrior, but it also gives us some insight. In spiritual warfare, which we're all in, we have Goliaths. We have opposition. We have opponents. There are things that come against us that are insurmountable. There's no way. We're, we're being told there's no way that you can actually win this battle. You might as well give up. That Goliath taunts you every day. Forty days in a row, Goliath would come out. Forty days in a row, he'd say, send me someone to fight me. Just one of you. And if you can defeat me, we will be your servants. Forty days in a row. And forty days in a row, the, the children of Israel hid from him, including the king. You have that kind of thing going on in your life all the time. There are Goliath's insurmountable obstacles. There are things in front of you that are impossible for you in your own strength to overcome. And it tells you that constantly. You cannot beat me. You have this habit of the flesh. You have this desire of the flesh. You have these things going on. You've got a, a shaky marriage right now. You're going to lose your house. You're going to lose your job. You've lost this and you've lost that. Your children are not going to make it. You've got that going constantly. And it's a Goliath. It's an obstacle that you don't believe you can, you can defeat. You need to see the principles here that I, that I see in Scripture that I think can help us, the things that we have, because in the Lord we can defeat, in the Lord we can win. You see, Saul wanted to be looked at as being a great king, so he gives to David his armor, but David's saying, I'm not going to bring glory to you when I can bring glory to God, and I'm going to go about this battle in the way that God has taught me. So Goliath, when he's facing David, represents more than just an actual living enemy, which he does, but also can represent the Goliaths in our life, and it can represent a world system that is at war against God and all that God is. And this world system rejects God. This world system rejects all who love God, all who serve God, and this world system that we have a war against desires to destroy all that belongs to God. And that's what we live under. That's the combat that we find ourselves in daily. David would represent a believer, one who's aware of the battle, one who's aware of the fact that God is the Lord of the battle, a believer who's prepared to fight and not give up. David would understand what John wrote in 1 John chapter 2 when John said, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is passing away, the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. David would understand that. David would understand that there's a battle that's going on right now. And he would understand that we need to stand in the Lord in order to have victory. We need to understand that we're in a spiritual war. And we need to take some lessons learned from David in order that we might have victory. One, I want you to notice in verse 23, because in verse 23 it, it, makes, it makes the point that Goliath once again came out and he spoke according to the same words. He'd been doing this for 40 days, but this time David heard those words. The first thing I need to understand is I've got an enemy who's after me. 
I need to believe that. I need to know that. I have to realize that, that there is an enemy that is after me. And this enemy wants to constantly browbeat me and wants to defeat me and wants me actually to believe that I'm defeated before we even engage in battle. Because if he can make you believe, if the enemy can make you believe that you can have no chance, then he's already defeated you without you even lifting up a sword against him. We need to know that there is an enemy. We also need to know his tactics and we need to know his weapons. We need to know that he uses intimidation. We need to know that he can cause us to be terribly afraid, even as the scripture says. We need to know that he works against us to try and tell us there's no chance and no hope, that there's nothing that can be done. He's going to defeat you. You're going to lose. You might as well give up. I was talking to somebody in between services today who approached me, and he, he, he had walked up to say, you know, Happy Father's Day, and it was very sweet of him and very kind. And, and yet he began to share with me, and he said, may I share with you how I came uh, uh, about coming to, to church here? And I said, sure, of course, I'd like to hear that. He said, years ago, he said, I was into drugs and things. He said, and I, I was getting ready for work. He said, and I, I had a joint, and I was getting ready to light it up. I was going to smoke my pot before I went to, to work. He said, so I was hunting on the radio dial looking for K-Rock. And as I was looking for, for that station, he goes, I, I dialed up 107.9, K-Wave. And so he says, there I am with my joint, and a voice comes over the radio, and I began to listen. And he said, this guy was saying, listen, I used to do drugs and I used to drink and, and my life was given over to that and I didn't believe I could be any different. I didn't believe that my life could ever be changed. I didn't believe that anything could be any different than what it was. But somebody came and preached to me the gospel of Jesus Christ and shared the word of God with me and when they shared the promises of God I began to listen and ultimately I committed my heart to Jesus Christ. And when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, my life was changed. No more alcohol, no more drugs. I was set free by the promises of God through Jesus Christ. And, and I would not be pastoring this church today if the gospel of Jesus Christ was not true. He said, I heard that said, and I started thinking within myself, this guy here knows drugs, this guy here knows alcohol, and now he's pastoring a church. Maybe I need to get away from these drugs. He said, the, light, uh, he said my, the, la uh, the match was, uh, was, was lighted, he says, I, I blew out the match, he said, and I took the joint, and I didn't smoke it. He said, I, I decided, well, I'm going to get away from drugs. It's not good for me. He said, and I drove to work. He said, and I was real active, and I was working harder than normal. And, and he said, my boss says to me, what did you take today? You're obviously on some drugs. <laughs> and he said, I didn't take anything. He said, I didn't take anything. He says, I'm clean. I haven't done anything. He says, well, no, you, you've obviously taken something. Something's, something happened to you. And he says, no, nothing. He goes, now, when I heard that voice coming over the radio, I, I had said, gosh, I wish I knew where, where he was at. I'd like to go to his church. He says, I, I met a guy. He said, when I met this guy, the guy invited me, knowing I had a drug problem, invited me to some ministry called Lion Tamers. He says, so I went to this Lion Tamers meeting, and they talked to me about freedom in Christ. But they also encouraged me to go to church. He said, so the next Sunday, he says, I walk in and I sit down in church and then I hear the voice of the guy who was on the radio speaking. It was you, Pastor David. It was this church. He said, I committed my heart to Jesus Christ. And he said, then God can transform lives. That's the point I'm trying to make. The Goliath is whispering in your ear saying, you can't change. That's a lie from the devil. God can transform your life. He can give you power to live for Jesus Christ. He can give you a new purpose and meaning. And you can overcome him because of the power that God gives you through the gospel of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He can change your life. And when Goliath says that's not true, that's a lie. It's a lie. Jesus Christ can transform your life. You need to know his tactics. He uses fear and he uses intimidation. And he will say you can never change. You'll never be any different. You're, you're, you, know, you, can't, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. All I need to do is remind him I'm not a dog. And I can learn, and God can transform me. And even if I were a dog, the Bible says I'll be a new creation in Christ Jesus. Okay, I was a dog, but now I'm fully in Christ. So it doesn't really matter to me at all. 
I can change. God can give you power to do so. We need to know those things. Also, we need to know the past victories and God's faithfulness. You need to look back at what God has done in the past. When David was speaking in verse 36, he made it very clear. I have killed a lion, I have killed a bear, and I can kill this uncircumcised Philistine too. God has been with me through the small things. He'll be with me in the larger things. Because with God, there's really nothing small and nothing really large. It's all the same to him. We need to understand that God can bring us through. And he, all you need to do is remember what God has done in the past and what God can do now. We need to use the gifts and tools that God has given to us. David was handed some armor that didn't fit. So he took that which does. A sling and he took his stones, those five smooth stones. Use the tools that God gave to you. When this church first began, I was a young man. I was 31 years old. And when this church first began, I had people showing up and they were saying, you know, I came out of Calvary Chapel Riverside and I started thinking, well, we have people who have sat under Greg Laurie's ministry, maybe they're expecting me to be like Greg Laurie. Others were coming out of Costa Mesa. Maybe they're expecting me to be like Pastor Chuck. Lord, who am I supposed to be like? They started coming from Calvary Chapel, West Covina. I said, oh God, please. Am I supposed to be like, oh, God, <laughs> forgive me, Lord. Who are you supposed to be like? Greg Laurie, Raul Reese, Chuck Smith. You're supposed to be like who you are. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You have to be yourself and use the gifts and talents God gave to you. Don't try to be somebody else. The armor doesn't fit. God has armor that fits just you. It is custom made for you. It's the gifts that he has given to you. Fight in that weaponry. Because you make a big mistake when you try and battle using somebody else's armor. Just be yourself. Understand that God can use you. He has gifted you. You also need to have a heart to fight. You have to have this willingness in you. There's got to be something inside of you. Inside of David, he said, and, and I love this man. I love him because of his attitude. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Can you see the anger in him? Can you see that righteous indignation in him? How dare you challenge God? How dare you Challenge the armies of the living God. Who are you? There's got to be something inside of you that rises up that says, listen, I'm not going to roll over and allow you to do this. You are not getting, you cannot have my children. You cannot have my wife. You cannot have my family. You cannot have them. You have to have that inside of you or you will lose. When you go out to battle, you go with the battle mentality. I will win or I will die trying, but there's no giving up in me. You have to have that. You have to have that. In spiritual warfare, I never enter into a battle thinking I'm going to lose. I enter into that battle saying I will do everything I can in Jesus Christ to win. We will win. And I read the last page of this book and it tells me I'm victorious in him. I have nothing to worry about. Even if I die in battle, I go to be with him. So you have to have that mentality. And I think the church lacks that today. It lacks that today. We're so busy trying to be liked by the world. We're so busy trying to be fitting in with the world. Let's face it, we're supposed to be different. We serve a living God, not a dead idol. And you will be different. And people will mock you. And people will have a problem with you. Love him in the name of Jesus, but love him more than you love your own reputation. And watch what God will do. God will work through you. Listen, if I didn't believe that, I would still be teaching Bible studies with nine people in them. Because that's what I did for years, and I was happy doing it. But I believe that God has more, and God wants to do more. And that's why I preach the way that I do. You need to have a will to fight, and you need to fight with certain victory. In Romans 8, 31, it says, what, sh what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
In Romans 8, 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. If God is for me, who can be against me? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You have to have that mentality when you enter in. And that's the mentality David had. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You come to me and I'm going to cut your head off and I will feed your body to the vultures. And the world will know that there is a God in Israel. And he ran to him. And as he did so, he pulled out that stone and he started swinging that, that sling and he let that missile go and it sunk three inches into the forehead of Goliath, knocked him flat back. He took the sword, cut his head off, held the head up and said, now who's going to follow me? Who's going to follow me? What a man. What a man. And you know what? All of a sudden Israel got brave. Israel got brave because one man trusted in God and Israel got brave. And that's what happens when you get brave in the Lord. You'll be surprised at the people who will line up behind you saying, where are you going? I'm going to go too. I want to go into battle with you because God is on your side and I want to do what God wants. You'll see that. It's absolutely true. Get on the Lord's side and watch what happens. Father, we ask that you would work in us. We ask that you would work in us that we might serve you, our living God. We have Goliaths, Lord, that we have to face. Spiritual giants that whisper in our ear that we cannot win. But we are more than conquerors. We can do all things through you who strengthens us. We are on your side. But what is more important is you are on ours. For the battle is yours. So Lord, I ask that you would work in us today. You would have your way through us. And that you would use us for your glory. Even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, perhaps there are some in this room today who need to get right with the Lord. I want to pray for you. And if God is speaking to your heart right now, I want to pray for you right now. Would you raise your hand and let me pray for you? Lord, in Jesus' name, you see these hands and you know exactly why they're being raised to you. I ask that you would reach down now, touch these lives, Lord, and work in them. If there are sin issues, things that they need to deal with, Father, I pray that you would just right now, as they relinquish them, as they yield them to you, that you would wash them and cleanse them, Lord, as they turn from them, that you would now fill them with your spirit and that they would now know your victory from this day forward. Move in them, empower them. Glorify yourself, Lord. We receive from you and thank you, Lord. Bless you. You can put your hands down. Jesus, I ask that you keep moving in all of us, that we would live lives of warriors that are victorious in Christ. We ask this now in your name. Amen. Let's all stand. We'll close with a word of prayer and a, a song. And once again, happy Father's Day to you, daddies. God bless you today. May you have a great, great day in the Lord. Hope to see some of you tomorrow at the 1835 or on Wednesday or whatever. May God be with you and strengthen you. Our Father, we ask that you work in us and use us for your glory. We're about to leave this place into a mission field that is filled with obstacles. But in you, we will triumph. In you, we will have victory. We give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.